2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the great apostasia. Does a great falling away from the faith precede the seven-year tribulation? What is the meaning of the phrase, day of Christ? Who is the restrainer, and when is he taken out of the way? I will answer these questions in this video. Greetings, I'm Dr. Paul Felter. Welcome to my video podcast, where I expose church fallacies and flawed Christian traditions with Bible truth. We let the Bible speak for itself. Let's begin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The two often misunderstood passages in that passage are the day of Christ and a falling away. I will address the phrase day of Christ first by making the first sentences, verses 1 and 2, more clear by removing the subordinate clause. As you know, a subordinate clause adds information to the sentence but does not affect its primary meaning. Removing the subordinate clause will not change the meaning of the sentence. It will make the sentence easier to understand. Now, the subordinate clause is the phrase, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. By removing that phrase, a clearer understanding of the sentence comes forth. Don't worry, we'll get to the meaning of the subordinate clause shortly. Here is the sentence of verse 1 and 2 without the subordinate clause. Now we beseech you, brethren, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ is at hand. Paul is pleading with the believers at Thessalonica not to be shaken in mind. In other words, not to be upset. Don't be anxious or fearful or troubled or disturbed about receiving a word, a forged letter, or a visit from man or spirit claiming that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, before we go further, we must define the phrase day of Christ within the context of the passage. Everyone knows the three rules of real estate, location, location, location. But many forget the three rules of Bible interpretation are context, context, and context. We must stay in context when defining the meaning of the phrase, Day of Christ. So many pastors, teachers, and especially modern Bible interpretations assign meanings to words based on definitions found in Strong's, Vines, or some other Greek lexicon ignoring the context of the passage. Words can have different meaning depending on the context. The word run can have several different meanings like run a marathon, run to the store, hit a home run, a run in a stocking, a runny nose, or running water. Each run has its context defined within the sentence wherein it is used. But when it comes to the Bible, Many somehow forget the context and assign meanings to words based on their personal beliefs, denominational dogmas, or church tradition, all of which are prone to error and misinterpretation of Scripture. Stop doing that. Let the Bible speak for itself. Let's get back to the phrase, Day of Christ. A little sanctified common sense goes a long way here. Let's look at some possibilities. Number one, the phrase day of Christ could refer to the rapture, but the believers would not have been upset or troubled. They would have been happy and rejoicing as they would soon be meeting the Lord in the air. Number two, the phrase day of Christ could refer to the day of the Lord, the seven-year tribulation. That would give them good reason to be upset and troubled if the tribulation was about to begin. Number three, 
Had Paul previously taught them to endure part or all of the seven-year tribulation, then there would be no reason to be upset and ask Paul for clarification on the matter. That would be what they would have expected. Number four. But had Paul taught that the rapture would precede the seven-year tribulation, then news that the tribulation was at hand or beginning would be very troubling, as that contradicted Paul's teaching. So, it is obvious that the day of Christ is a reference to the day of the Lord, the seven-year tribulation. The use of the word Christ in this phrase, day of Christ, is not an issue as Jesus Christ is Lord. Day of Christ, day of the Lord, same thing. It's also obvious that Paul taught the believers that the rapture precedes the tribulation. Hearing otherwise would have made them troubled and upset. Let's add the second sentence to complete the context. Now we beseech you, brethren, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Paul then implores them not to be deceived. Don't give any regard to those that bring teachings that contradict what I have taught you. Don't let them deceive you by any means, by word, by fake letter, or by an evil spirit. We are commanded many times in the New Testament not to be deceived. As we are living in the closing days of the dispensation of grace, deception and propaganda rule the day. Don't you be deceived either. Let's look at the subordinate clause I previously removed as it sets the subject of the passages. The phrase is, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at which believers are gathered unto him is the rapture. The believers at Thessalonica wanted confirmation about the timing of the rapture with respect to the tribulation, the day of Christ. Let's continue in verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Notice the phrase, that day shall not come. What day is Paul referring to with the phrase, that day? That day refers to a day previously mentioned in the text, the day of Christ, the tribulation. Paul clearly states that day, the day of Christ, the tribulation, will not come except something else comes first, the falling away, the apostasia. Before the tribulation can begin, there must be a falling away or an apostasia. But what does the word apostasia mean? The word only occurs one other time in the King James Bible, that being Acts 21.21. 21. And they that are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles, to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Here the Greek word apostasia is translated forsake. Forsaking Moses means forsaking or departing from the law of Moses, including circumcision and keeping the Jewish customs. How has the word apostasia been used historically? Here is our primary text taken from the Geneva Bible of 1599, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 3. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our assembling unto him, that ye be not suddenly moved from your mind, nor troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as it were from us, as though the day of Christ were at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a departing first, and that the man of sin be disclosed, even the son of perdition. The Greek word apostasia has been translated as departing or departure throughout the history of the English Bible. Even Jerome's Vulgate, 
of the 4th century uses the Latin phrase venerit decessio primum, is translated as departure comes first. The following chart shows the history of the English Bible with respect to the translation of the Greek word apostasia. 332, Jerome's Latin Vulgate, departure first. 1384, Wycliffe's Bible, departing first. 1526, Tyndale Bible, departing first. 1535, the Coverdale Bible, departing first. 1539, the Kramer Bible, departing first. 1576, Breach's Bible, departing first. 1583, Beza Bible, departing first. 1608, Geneva Bible, departing first. The King James Bible, falling away. Historically, the Greek word apostasia has been translated as departing in all the English Bibles since Wycliffe penned the first English Bible in 1384. Why the King James translators chose to use the phrase falling away remains a mystery. Another interesting aspect of verse 3 is that Paul uses a definite article before the word apostasia. By using a definite article, Paul draws attention to the fact that the apostasia is a singular event, not a long process such as falling away from the faith. Ever since the first century, people have been falling away from the faith in one part of the world or another. Even in the Apostle Paul's day, he noted the following. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia are turned away from me, of whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. 2 Timothy 1, 15. The apostasia of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, is not a long process of years, but a singular event. The rapture easily satisfies the context and the grammar. Also, the apostasia, being the departure, is congruent with verse 1, our gathering unto the Lord, the rapture. That interpretation gives continuity to the passage, as the topic of verse 1, the rapture, is carried through in verse 3, the departing. Let me give you my paraphrase of the passage. Now we implore you, brethren, with respect to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him at the rapture, that ye be not distressed, upset, or be troubled, neither by an evil spirit, nor by a spoken word, nor by a forged letter, as from us, that the day of the Lord, the tribulation, is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, the day of the Lord, shall not come, except the rapture come first, and then the man of sin be revealed, the Antichrist, the son of perdition. The timeline for the passage is this. Number one, the departing, the rapture comes first, with the rapture being the context stated in the first verse, you would expect the text to reference the rapture in a subsequent sentence. Otherwise, there is no continuity in the passage. The poorly translated falling away in the King James Bible is the rapture of the church. This is the crux of the issue. The falling away is the departure, which is the rapture, not a falling away from the faith. Number two, then the man of sin, the Antichrist, is revealed beginning the tribulation. The prophet Daniel tells us that the tribulation begins with the Antichrist confirming a seven-year covenant with Israel, which includes the rebuilding of the temple. In chapter 9 of his writing, we read, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Daniel 9.27 At the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist enters the newly rebuilt Jewish temple, committing the abomination of desolation. The Apostle Paul describes the abomination of desolation in verse 4 of our text. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, 
or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? At the midpoint, the three and a half years, the man of sin, the Antichrist, commits the abomination of desolation when he proclaims himself God. The temple becomes desolate of God's presence, and God's wrath is poured out upon the Antichrist and his followers for the remaining three and a half years. Paul reminds the believers at Thessalonica that he taught them these things when he was with them so they should remember. Continuing with the text. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. 2 Thessalonians 2, 6 and 7. There is something or someone withholding or restraining the revealing of the Antichrist and therefore the starting of the seven-year tribulation. The only entity strong enough to restrain evil on a global scale is the Holy Spirit, and he is the only member of the Trinity currently on earth. He indwells believers during this present dispensation of grace, and we are sealed with his presence awaiting the rapture. Here again, the continuity of the Holy Spirit being taken out of the way in verse 7 with the rapture is consistent with verse 1, our gathering unto the Lord. Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts, 2 Corinthians 1.22. And whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and whom also, that after ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1.13. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption, Ephesians 4.30. The Holy Spirit is active on earth through the church, the body of Christ. He currently restrains the revealing of the Antichrist and the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. At the rapture, the Holy Spirit removes his restraining power, and then the Antichrist will be revealed, beginning the tribulation. Back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8-10. through 10. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. After the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is removed, that wicked, the Antichrist, will be revealed. But the Lord Jesus Christ will destroy that wicked at his second coming by the word of God and light. The Antichrist power is from Satan, doing signs and wonders to deceive mankind into following him. Those that follow the Antichrist will perish with him as they have no love for the truth. Every day we see people on TV, the internet, and social media who have no love for the truth. They lie and are proud of it. I would not want to be in their shoes on Judgment Day. Verses 7 and 8 state that the restrainer, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way and then that wicked, the Antichrist, is revealed. That is consistent with verse 3, wherein the departure or the rapture comes first, then the man of sin is revealed. The continuity and harmony of the passage is clear. Verses 11 and 12. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Because they had no love for the truth, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie that the Antichrist is God. This belief will damn their souls to the lake of fire, along with all those who love their sin. Continuing with the text. 
But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God had from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, wherein he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul gives thanks to the Lord for the believers in Thessalonica as they are beloved and chosen by God from the beginning to obtain salvation through the gospel of grace preached by the Apostle Paul. They were blessed with the power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit, and they sought out and believed the truth, God's truth, a commodity greatly lacking in the modern church and society. Most in church want to be spiritually entertained, told how wonderful they are and how God could not get along without them. Propaganda is the main fare both in the church and society. Sadly, many prefer the artificial sweetness of lies over the pure honey of truth. Moving on. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Paul encourages the believers to stand fast and hold to his teaching on the rapture. Disregard anything that differs from what Paul taught them by direct word when he was present at Thessalonica or by his letter. We must do the same and reject any and all false teachings that place the body of Christ, the church, in the tribulation. The mid-trib, post-trib, and pre-wrath teachings are false. The only position that satisfies all scripture is the pre-tribulation rapture. That's what the Apostle Paul taught, and that's what we must believe. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation, and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, and establish you in every good word and work. Verses 16 and 17. Paul prays that the everlasting grace and comfort be upon their hearts, and they grow in the knowledge of the word and the good works that God has for them in doing his will. Paul's closing remarks are of grace and comfort as they remember and continue in his teaching on the rapture and the day of Christ. In this chapter, Paul teaches that the rapture, the departing, comes first, and then the man of sin is revealed beginning the seven-year tribulation. Believers are to take comfort in knowing that they will be removed from earth just prior to the tribulation. We, the church, are not appointed unto wrath, but to have been delivered by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Thank you, Lord Jesus. An integral part of understanding your Bible is to see God's timeline from Genesis to Revelation in chart format. I have two such works available in print and PDF. The first is a free, rightly dividing the word of truth chart in landscape format. This chart displays God's timeline from Genesis to Revelation. It alone is a tremendous help in understanding the Bible and can easily be downloaded from my website. Second, a letter-sized booklet named The Master Key to Understanding the Bible. This 64-page guide is full color and professionally printed. It has 13 large full color charts displaying the right division concept in great detail. The guide is a must have companion for the serious Bible student. The master key is also available in audiobook on Amazon Audible. Both are available on my website breadoflife.media. If you have enjoyed the video podcast, then please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and my podcast channel, both named Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. Thank you for joining me today. See you next time, and God bless.